Welcome back to Face the Nation. We continue our conversation with President Trump's campaign manager, Brad Parscale. Around the time of the shutdown, the 35-day shutdown we went through, uh, there were fundraising ads going out to supporters uh, saying, you know, send a brick to Nancy. Yeah, um, I love that idea. Nancy being Speaker of the House, of course. Yeah. Uh, and, and this was a way to raise funds. Yep. How successful was it? A oh, that one was like great. That? that was, you know, a campaign like that could raise three, four million dollars. Um, you know, from these small dollar oh, from donors. small dollar donors. You know, they want to. How be, does that work? Well, they want to be part of an activity. They they want to be involved, and uh, this is a way that they got to to buy a foam brick and and get it labeled with their name and sent to Nancy Pelosi's office and say, you know, build the wall. You know, it's a it's a way for them somewhere in the middle of Nebraska who is so you know far from the system but wants to be involved. This is a way for them to put $25, $45 and say, look, I want to make a difference. We do that with t-shirts. We do that with hats. We've sold, uh, we're closing on selling our one millionth red MAGA hat. Um, you, know, uh, you know, those are 45 bucks a piece. You know, do the math there really quick. It's $45 million. So the, those kind of things that this president has, has changed the game in way merchandise, um, rallies, um, the entire experience of being part of the political um, uh, political movement, he's changed it. He, but beyond the branding, the value to you campaign-wise is that you retain small. that information. I retain, I retain information, and we get to keep we get to keep the net, net proceeds. Oh, but I'm curious, how does that affect the messaging? I mean, if these are people who feel uh, motivated enough or want to be activist enough yeah. to give on the particular issue, is the yeah. president changing his messaging to match that, or no. is his uh, you know, agenda driven by the White House. No. It's so the, you're kind of twisting that a little bit. The, well, explain it. So what happens is the president sets his policies. These are what they are. Now, those policies are, have a range of things. Uh, one person at, you know, 1300 Elm Street could really care about immigration. But at 1305 Elm Street, they could really care about tariff policy. Now, that doesn't mean we're changing what the president's message is to them. We are showing them the part of the message that's right for them. And how much can you actually know about someone based on what well, text they've sent? I mean, do you know how they voted in the past yeah, or what some, motivated them last so, time? So we, the Republican Party built this thing called the Data Trust, one of the largest databases in the world to understand what people are and can now provide over to me a universe of people attached in the social media and or possibly by text message or different ways and say, hey, these are the people that are saying in the criteria you're speaking about. How many rallies are we going to see President Trump out there doing? Oh, lot. How involved is he in some of these decisions on messaging? So I always explain it like this. He is the um, captain of the ship. He is, he, is the, he is the engineer of the Trump train. He is the campaign manager, the communications manager, the finance director, um, coalitions director, all things. My job is to be the Trump conductor. My job is to keep the cars together, keep them running on time, get them to the place they need to go. You're a disruptor. The president also likes championing that. But you're talking now to people like Karl Rove, a oh, yeah. Bush advisor. Yeah. So it's, since, since you've come to Washington, so to speak, ha well, has that that's changed not you? I, I, yes, it's changed me. I have a lot less um, um, faith in the system. You really understand how swampy it is until you get here. Um, I think as a disruptor, though, um, yes, in a history of, you know, I think that those who don't understand history are due to repeat it in a positive or negative way. And for me not to understand what every predecessor of mine did and what they understood and how they thought, um, regardless of the technology at the time, would be doing a disservice to my boss. So, um, so do you coordinate with Carl Rove? It's not a coordination. It's a learning process. Hey, what did you do? Tell me your stories. What were the worst moments you had? What were the best moments? If you did it over again, what do you think you would do? What, how'd you handle this situation. You know, education, um, there's not a lot of people running around that have won elections hmm. on the Republican side or the Democrat side. I mean, the last guy to win a re-election is Karl Rove and Melman in 2004 for Republican. And before that, it was Reagan that won a re-election. So it's not like there's a club you can go to and there's mm -hmm. just all these re-electing winning campaign managers. So um, they're telling you how to build out a ground not, game. No, not talk, talk. No, now you're saying that. I'm asking them for historical context. You know, they don't know what I know and some things I don't know what they know. Um, but they've had to live through it. And, and, and Carl's given me some great things afterwards, said, you know what? If I did it again, I would have done this or I wouldn't have done that. And hindsight is a great weapon to have when you're up in front of it again. So you like the establishment, but sometimes. I don't like the establishment. I like the diversity of knowledge. 
Um, and I'm going to use all of it I can to help get President Trump reelected again in 2020. Brad Parscale, thank you for joining thank you. us. We'll be right back with our political panel. We now turn to our political panel for some analysis. Jamal Simmons is a Democratic strategist and host on Hill TV. Lonnie Chen is a policy expert and fellow at the Hoover Institution. Amy Walter is the national editor of the Cook Political Report. And Mark Landler covers the White House and foreign policy for The New York Times. Congrats to you. Uh, on going to London, I understand. You're going to be the new London bureau chief. Margaret, thank you. Invite me back. I'll talk all about Prince Harry. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget about Meghan Markle. Yeah. Yes, I <laughs> She's the star in that equation. We, we do hope to have you back at this table. Um, I want to start us off um, this launch this week. It happened. Joe Biden made it official. Uh, we've been talking about it for so, so long. Uh, but he chose an interesting way to say what inspired him. I want to play for you some of his ad. And that's when we heard the words of the President of the United States that stunned the world and shocked the conscience of this nation. He said there were, quote, some very fine people on both sides. Very fine people on both sides? But those words, the President of the United States assigned a moral equivalence between those spreading hate and those with the courage to stand against it. And in that moment, I knew the threat to this nation was unlike any I had ever seen in my lifetime. I was talking about people that went because they felt very strongly about the monument to Robert E. Lee, a great general. Whether you like it or not, he was one of the great generals. Amy, <laughs> where, do we go with where do we go with this? Why relitigate Charlottesville and in ter on the president's response there? But also, is this the right way to launch a campaign? Right. Is this where the Democratic Party should be focused right now? It's to pretty use clear this, this painful moment in a political yeah, way. I mean, it's pretty clear that it, from that video, you got a couple of things that we understand about Joe Biden. One. Unlike other people in this race, Joe Biden is only running because Donald Trump is president. I think regardless of it were President Ted Cruz uh, in office, Bernie Sanders would be running. Elizabeth Warren would probably be running. Those folks are running much more as revolutionary candidates who believe that the system itself is broken and needs to be fixed. What Biden is saying is the system isn't broken. It's the person in charge of the system who's broken. So I'm going to bring back some normalcy. I'm going to bring us back to what we thought were agreed on American values, right? That you don't um, say of people who show up at a rally of, with not white nationalists that that's okay. But you're right, then we're getting back into the fight where the president really loves to play, which is really the debate over who has the values of America? Who is it that, where are the cultural touchstones that relate more to, to voters? And that's where Democrats are, They've tried this. Hillary Clinton tried it. It was not as successful. The, the challenge for the president, I mean, I'm sorry, the, the challenge for the vice president is to be able to make that transition to the next piece of this, which is who's going to keep America moving forward, mm -hmm. especially on economics? Who has the answer for the middle class? That's what apparently he's going to be doing in these next couple of days as he goes to Pennsylvania and, and lays that out. What do you think, as a Democratic strategist, uh, using this as a motivating principle? Oh, I think it's the right thing. I think a lot of Democrats agree that the, the, what the president is doing is giving, President Trump is doing, is giving aid and comfort, cultural, cultural aid and comfort to white nationalists. And that is something that a lot of Democrats and a lot of Americans who are not Democrats um, are very uncomfortable with. So the framing of that is right. The vice president got off to a strong start. He raised a lot of money. He put a good team in place. Um, I think a lot of Democrats feel more comfortable about that. The question for the vice president, for Vice President Biden is, a lot of Democrats aren't just looking for a change in management. They're looking for a change in direction. Mm -hmm. And the idea that we're going to go back, he said at one point that he wanted to go uh, tell America's allies that America's coming back, the, old, the America they knew was coming back. You know, for a lot of Democrats, they don't think the America we knew was that great of a place. There was still all the economic strife. Um, and a lot of that is what produced Donald Trump. So the question is not about taking America back to something, but where are we going forward with America? And I think if Vice President Biden can capture that voice, 
he could be a strong Democratic candidate. I think you called it revelation, or revolution versus restoration. Um, Lonnie, what do you think about the president here? I, I, Amy suggests that in some ways Biden is playing to the president's strength or at least a tool he likes to use. I, I think he is. I think the president really understands his base, I think, in a way that few presidents have understood the base electorate that supports them. Successful presidential campaigns are when the person meets the moment. And the question for Joe Biden, is he the right person for the moment we're in? I think that's the question everyone's asking. He's a decidedly 20th century candidate in a 21st century campaign. And I think the big question is going to be, you know, this launch, I think, was splashy for the message. But is he going to stay on that message? Is he really going to come to this middle class economics question? Hard thing to do when you've got a 3.2 percent growth right. rate, low unemployment, and people feel that, this, that this, the strains of economic anxiety, some of them are still there, but by and large, the economy has done well. So I think the vice president, Vice President Biden, is going to have to figure out, does he stay on this track of sort of continuing to be provocative, or does he come back to these bread and butter economic issues? And I think that's going to be a much more difficult challenge for him than he thinks. Except I do have to say, there are a lot of Americans who are, oh, while they may have jobs, they have jobs making less money than they made before. I'm from Michigan, where auto workers used to make $30, $40 an hour, and now they start at $18, $22 an hour. That is real money for people. And so I think there we do have full employment, but it's full employment at what wage? Mm -hmm. Mark, when you heard the president even just at this rally yesterday, which he attended rather than go to the correspondence dinner here in Washington, he continues to return to the, the familiar messages of immigration, but also the economy. I mean, the economy seems to be the thing that the Republicans are most confident about and that he wants to run on here. So is there a way for Democrats to puncture that? Well, I think, Lon, he got it that that's going to be the quandary for Democrats. The, the most recent economic number that came out late last week was really strong. Right. And I think it put to bed the idea that this is an economy on the cusp of a slowdown or perhaps even a recession. I think six months ago, a lot of Democrats thought that that's the election they were going to be running into, and that once you puncture the myth that Trump has a winning, winning economy, then all his other flaws become far more apparent. Now it looks like he may, in fact, continue to run with a strong economy, and I think that makes the Democratic uh, challenge a great deal harder. And I think that's why it was interesting last night at the rally. He could have gone a number of different ways. At previous rallies that coincided with the White House, House Correspondents uh, Association dinner. He's been very anti-press. He's he's really given a very red meat speech. This, by Trump standards, was actually less red meat than we've seen and more focused on the economic record. He really went through it very methodically, very systematically, and I think that's because they recognize they have a fairly strong case to make. I mean, not to bring up bad memories <laughs> from 2012, sorry, many, from the Romney campaign. <laughs> but I do remember that was the, the case that the Romney campaign made throughout 2012 was don't focus on the president himself and his, uh, what he's doing as president. Focus on the economy, the economy, the economy. And it was true when you looked at President Obama's record in terms of his job approval rating on the economy, much lower than his overall job approval rating, right? So, of course, focus on the thing that he's weakest mm -hmm. on. But what we found was that, and this happened with um, George W. Bush as well, the overall approval rating of the president, how people feel about the president, was more important in terms of its sort of predictive value than how they felt the, the person was doing handling the economy. This president is completely different. His overall approval rating, how people feel about him as president, has always consistently been eight, nine points lower than his handling of the economy. And so, you know, voters, they, we're humans. We go into the voting booth with a whole mm -hmm. bunch of conflicting things going on in our minds. The economy in and of itself is one piece, but it is not the only thing that voters use to evaluate whether they want to see this person spending another right. four years in the Oval Office. Mark, one of the things that we haven't heard really any of the Democratic candidates do is explain their vision for America's role in the world. Many of them have, though, signed on to, oh, we'll reinstate the Iran nuclear deal, at least on that one specific issue. Um, how important is it that we start to hear about this on the campaign trail? Well, I think we can stipulate that in primaries, uh, except in years where the country is truly at war, in the, during the Iraq War, for example, foreign policy is generally not a driving issue. It can be a driving issue in a general election, but again, not every time, once in a while. I think the interesting thing 
that the Trump administration does, though, is it, it actually puts Democrats in a little bit of an awkward position on foreign policy because some of the issues that President Trump has tended and positions he's tended to take actually resonate with Democrats. Mm. Staying out of foreign conflicts, mm -hmm. endless foreign wars. Uh, the trade policy, again, is quite a resonant with some significant portion of the Democratic base. So I think if you're a Democratic candidate and you're squaring off against President Trump, the old arguments Democrats used to make about Republicans don't really apply. And I think they need to find a language that sort of matches up well with America first, with free and fair and reciprocal trade agreements. This is language that de the Democratic foreign policy elite recoils at. But voters may actually appeal, it may actually appeal to voters and not just only Republican voters. Here's what President Trump said is Joe Biden's vulnerability. I'm so young. I can't believe it. I'm the youngest person. I am a young, vibrant man. I look at Joe. I don't know about him. I don't know. 72-year-old president, 76-year-old vice president Joe Biden, 77-year-old Bernie Sanders. Yeah. This is not generational change. <laughs> this is not generational change. And it may not be the country is really interested in generational change, but again, they're interested in something that's about a change in direction. Mm -hmm. You know, we talked about this, uh, this foreign policy question that Mark was just mentioning, but it's built on a house of tissue paper because the, Donald Trump's fundamental problem here is that people just don't really know when to trust him. And this is another example. He just said, I'm young. Mm -hmm. It's very, he could have just left it at, I'm vibrant, and he might have been okay. <laughs> but, but the problem is they lie even when the truth is a pretty decent thing. Yeah, I, you know. <laughs> we, we, we do have to leave it there. I'm so sorry, Lenny, <laughs> but we'd want to have you back uh, for further conversation. In a moment, we'll return with our interview with Javad Zarif, Iran's foreign minister. Tensions have been high between the U.S. and Iran since President Trump quit the Iran nuclear deal. In the past weeks, they've climbed even higher. The U.S. labeled Iran's military a terrorist organization and demanded other countries stop purchasing its oil. We sat down with Iranian Foreign Minister Javad Zarif. We do not want conflict. We resist. But we're not seeking confrontation. We don't believe that President Trump wants confrontation. But we know that there are people who are pushing for one. Military confrontation. I don't, you think, don't military think military will confrontation happen. will happen. I think people have uh, more prudence than allowing a military confrontation to happen. But I think the U.S. administration is putting uh, things in place for accidents to happen, and there has to be extreme vigilance so that people who are planning this type of accident would not have their way. Who's Interest. Doing that? Uh, my B team. What do you Akka, mean B team? Ambassador Bolton, one B, BB Netanyahu, second B, Bin Zayed, third B, Bin Salman, fourth B. These people want confrontation. And I believe it is important for the prudent people, for the grown ups, to prevent confrontation. When you and I sat down and spoke just a year or more ago, you said that your president refused to meet with President Trump here in New York. Do you regret that now? Do no, you we think don't. We cannot meet somebody who is not respectful, who has violated his country's international obligations, who has withdrawn from agreements. We have 150 pages of carefully negotiated agreement a multilateral agreement endorsed by the Security Council, where the United States is a permanent member. So if, if the United States does not respect that, what would it respect? The Trump administration, as we mentioned, is rumping up pressure. This designation of the IRGC as a foreign terrorist organization is going to squeeze Iran's already troubled economy even further. What is the impact going to be if this happens and, as the U.S. says, May 2nd is the deadline for the rest of the world to stop buying Iran's oil? Well, it will show to the Iranian people that the United States is not worthy of being a negotiating partner. That's what it will prove. It depends on whether Europe, as well as other members of the JCPOA, want to leave their destiny in the hands of an administration 
that does not respect its words. We will survive. We have survived tougher days. The Secretary of State has said, look, if you just look at the facts on the ground, 603 American service people killed by Iran, he attributes this, and the IEDs have maimed American service people in the battlefields. He looks at that, he looks at what's happening in Syria and Yemen and says, look, we're just recognizing facts. That's his explanation for this designation. Well, uh, he's wrong. He's wrong because they have aligned themselves with the wrong people in our region. And they cannot accept that they're suffering defeat because they simply chose the wrong side. You were talking about they what's have, happening in Syria. They are everywhere. They have spent far more money than anybody else, $7 trillion according to President Trump. When I spoke with President Trump in February, he said that he was going to keep U.S. troops in Iraq to watch Iran. Well, and he immediately that? heard from the Iraqis that that is not how they see the presence of U.S. forces. Did you hear that? You as see, a I went to Iraq. I stayed in Iraq for five days. I went to five cities. I went among the people of Iraq. And I was welcomed by them. I went to public places. President Trump flew to Iraq to a military base and left from the same military base within hours in the dark of night. Our president went to Iraq, stayed there for three days, went to public meetings in three Iraqi cities. Now, you tell me who's welcome in Iraq and who's not. Did you hear that as a threat from the president? I think the Iraqis heard that as a threat from the president. The Secretary of State, when he was testifying before Congress, uh, specifically said that there is absolutely no doubt that there are ties between Iran and al-Qaeda, full stop. It brought up this question of whether the U.S. is going to try to use some kind of authorization for military force to strike Iran on the basis of past support for that kind of terrorism. Well, uh, last I remember, 15 of the 21 9-11 uh, terrorists were Saudi citizens, none were Iranian. You're not concerned that the U.S. is looking I'm, I'm concerned about for the possibility of how to I'm, strike I'm, I'm concerned about hidden agendas that some people are following. Uh, I know that President Trump had uh, ran on a campaign promise of not engaging in any more foolish wars. Uh, I know that some other people have different agendas. Our full interview with Foreign Minister Zarif is available on our website at facethenation.com. That's it for us today. Thank you for watching. Until next week, for Face the Nation, I'm Margaret Brennan.